You're listening to TIP. In today's episode, I chat with Greg Bell to learn about his journey into investing in a unique income product, whether or not you should be thinking about credit alternatives in today's environment, and how to get started as a new investor. Greg is a seasoned debt investor and entrepreneur whose expertise resides at the intersection between credit, hedge funds, and blockchain technology. Greg is the co-founder of A3 Financial Investments and is the portfolio manager for the A3 Alternative Credit Fund, NASDAQ ticker AAACX. As stock investors, and generally young stock investors at that, we tend to be focused on the equities market, and we sometimes forget to think about the debt markets. This episode with Greg is very interesting and insightful regarding the various different investment opportunities available in the debt markets. So without further delay, let's jump into my conversation with Greg Bell. You're listening to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire the millennial generation. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Millennial Investing Podcast. With me today, I have Greg Bell. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you. Really excited to be here. For those who aren't yet familiar with you, tell us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. My investment career has been, well, anything but traditional, I would say. I worked at several multi billion dollar hedge funds. I'm not a stock picker. I started professionally at a firm called Silver Point Capital back in 2006, pre crisis. And the asset class for the investment that we were looking at was life settlements. It's a product where we are buying life insurance policies from uh, individuals and then profiting off their death benefits for their mortality event. It was a really interesting and formative sort of first professional investment because it just opened my eyes to this wide world of alternative investments and the creativity that exists in the investment framework away from just you know, equities. You know, from there, I went on to build out a highly successful product and business at a uh, investment bank, trading and structuring reverse mortgages. And more recently, my team and I were the first to create a loan product that was secured by Bitcoin, so a crypto-backed loan, and that was back in 2016. So I've really gone through a variety of just you know, unusual types of investments and have continued that through to today, that sort of untraditional path in an entrepreneurial venture, forming our own investment advisor with some colleagues called A3 Financial. Yeah, it's really interesting once you get off that beaten path of just equities and real estate to see just how many other different assets that you could invest in that are out there. There's so many different alternative assets you can invest in. That's right. It's a wide world. What was the genesis for A3 Financial? Why did you want to become an entrepreneur and a founder rather than just continuing to be a traditional individual investor or working at a hedge fund and just staying where you were? My team and I, we, we recognized a problem and we wanted to build a solution, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. My partners and I had been immersed in the investment management business for many decades, and, and several of them had had their own entrepreneurial ventures that were very successful. And you know, about two years ago, we looked around at each other and realized that whether you're an individual or an institution, there was this big problem that was glaring. It was a real dilemma. And it was around income. We exist in this near zero rate environment, and there had to be a better way to provide income for those that are trying to build portfolios that you know, provide cash flow. And that was really the, the foundational components around A3 Financial. It's an interesting world we live in today. 90% of government bonds trade at yields less than 1%. That's a, a crazy figure. And you look at upwards of 25% in the past year of bonds that have been trading at negative yields. And you compare that to stocks, the S&P 500 is an example that has its dividend yield at 1.82%. These are just small figures and and it's difficult for a large population, especially our parents, my parents and, and aging populations that are naturally migrating their investments from equities to more fixed income investments to fund their lives really. 
And so that was a problem that we said, hey, we can, we can find a better way. And it's off the beaten path, which is where I've kind of always found my niche to be. This excess debt environment, we've got crazy amounts of sovereign debt. We've got record high household debt. We've got record high corporate debt. And this debt, which everybody is aware of, is sometimes difficult to quantify. And it creates these just very interesting supply and demand dynamics that can be very favorable to investors in the the, right markets. And what I've always found is that where I'm able to find smaller niche products away from the herd, especially those that can benefit from non-traditional drivers, like demographics as an example, then you get really favorable environments and it's a really exciting place to be. We're going to dive deep into your fund and the underlying investments that you're making and just overall what this type of investment means and looks like. But before we get into that fund a bit more, for those listening who aren't familiar with credit and income funds, please explain what a credit fund is and also what alternative credit is. So a credit fund is simply just a portfolio of of debt or loan investments. And really, there are two broad types. There is the income-based debt products, those that rely on the cash flows from an individual or business, your personal income from having a job or the sales from a uh, a business. And then there's asset-based credit or asset-based lending, which is derived from some percentage value of an asset like a house. So those are kind of the the broad characteristics. And then a, a fund is just a portfolio of those. We mentioned a little bit about how much debt there is, but, but it's difficult to quantify. You look at the equity markets in the U.S., and that certainly dominates the headlines. That's it. In the U.S., being the largest equity market globally, it's $38 trillion, and that's a, that's a huge figure. But the bond market is actually bigger. The debt market's much bigger. It's $41 trillion in the U.S. alone. And when you include foreign debt, a lot of which is denominated in dollars, then you're actually looking at a figure that's $114 trillion. So it's this huge part of the market that, from an individual's perspective, is often kind of more on the sidelines because it's difficult to gain access to. Debt markets require usually a lot more capital, and that's why you see mutual funds and hedge funds that sort of dominate these, these spaces. But it doesn't have to be that way. And so that's one of, been one of the goals of, of my firm to help gain access for individual investors to products that they may not have otherwise gained exposure to. And I really think they should because they're great advantages of that, especially when you're talking about drivers like demographics. Demographics are something that personally I find just really fascinating. And I I sort of uh, talk about this a lot on my personal Twitter feed, but they tell the story. And we're at a place now in the US and globally where aging demographics are changing the economic landscape. We've got people that are 65 years and older for the first time in over 100 years that are outnumbering those that are under the age of five. And you've got these huge populations of wealth accumulators. It's an interesting stat I saw from the Financial Times only a week or two ago, and it was comparing the household wealth that millennials have today versus the household wealth that was that built by parents generally, baby boomers. And you, know, you look at about 3% wealth that's accumulated in millennials, and that was 21% for our, our parents. And so that's resulted, there's a lot of impacts of that, of that wealth accumulation. They have these assets now that they're going to be migrating just naturally as they age, which gets to these supply demand dynamics that I was talking about when you have these huge populations of older people that are retiring and deciding that, hey, maybe I'm going to reallocate some of my equities into a debt product. Then you have flow of funds and you have a trend that is part of the investment thesis that we try to look at and profit from and be on the right side. So let's walk through a couple of those examples or specific investments that you guys have made. How do you look at potential investments? When we're talking about credit and certainly niche credit, which is sort of the asset classes that are away from $16 trillion treasury market or $10 trillion mortgage market or $9 trillion corporates. When you're talking about these smaller things that are influenced by unique value drivers, 
taxation, demographics, insurance, or unusual collateral. It's about looking at the downside protection because credit is, is, is something, you're lending somebody money and your return upside is capped. You're going to get back if all things work well, your principal and the amount you lent to them plus some interest. But your risk, if there's a default, is far greater generally than your, than your upside. And so it's really downside protection first and foremost. And so that's where you know, we look at the ability of the, somebody, the borrower to pay, the collateral form. So if they don't pay, there's an asset that can be seized and sold and liquidated to recover some of the, the loss. And then a, a process of weighting those probabilities and trying to find a scenario where the general macro trend is in your favor, such that you are able to profit both from the interest and in some cases you can sell that asset at a premium. And that's a game of, you know, sort of musical chairs, if you will, where you're originating a product and if somebody has an appetite to buy that from you at a at a premium, then you can capture a little bit more uh, return that way. And that's what you're seeing largely in the treasury markets today, where you have these people that are so hungry for yield, even if it's negative, that they'll buy a negative yielding asset because they think that somebody tomorrow will pay more for it because rates are going further down. It's a really unique world that we live in today. So can you give some examples of the specific types of loans that you're essentially investing in? Are you essentially lending money like a mortgage? Give me some examples of, of the specific. A great example, and one of the largest concentrations that we currently have in our fund is of a reverse mortgage. So reverse mortgages, if you turned on CNBC, probably seen the fonts from Happy Days or Tom Selleck pitching this product to senior citizens that are you know, 60, 62 and older. And it's a way for a retired person to turn their home into an ATM to fund their life in the most basic way. It's a, actually a quite expensive product for a consumer, but from an investor standpoint, it's really interesting, especially in a world where you see high unemployment scenario where there are businesses that are struggling that risk reward for lending people cash has been changed dramatically this year. And so for a, in a reverse mortgage, the borrower is already retired. The borrower actually isn't making monthly payments. So you're not having the same risk profile as you have in a traditional mortgage product where somebody's paying their monthly interest and principal. With a reverse mortgage, it's actually accrued. So a borrower, as a basic example, takes out half of the value of their house and they use that to fund their life. And each month, rather than making a payment to the bank, the amount that they owe increases. And so that increases and increases every single month until they either pass away, they die, or they sell that home. And then the entire lump sum of the amount owed and the accrued interest is repaid to us. So it's a really interesting and unique investment from the standpoint that it, it accrues rather than requires monthly payments. It also comes with a government guarantee and that this is a AAA rated investment. This is backed by the full faith and taxation power of the United States government. So from a credit perspective, credit risk perspective, it's the same as treasuries. It's AAA rated. And that provides an insurance against the default of the borrower and failure to pay. So we like to look for unique investments in small markets that have really interesting value drivers. In this case, a demographic trend of older aging population, more supply coming to the market, a guarantee from a government body, in this case, the actual United States federal government that's guaranteeing payments. And then a scenario where you're less exposed to the major macro risks that we see in today's markets. And with high unemployment, there's a lot of credit products, loan products, whether it's your mortgage or corporate loan that are under stress because there's uncertainty to whether that borrower can continue to make their payments. So that's one unique investment that we really like and that we have a large position within our portfolio. Another is a finding unique collateral forms. So as I mentioned, it's downside protection is, is really one of the big focuses that we look for when we're investing in, in credit. And so if you can lend to somebody that has an asset and if you're able to find an asset that is difficult to lend against, then you have a benefit from the supply-demand dynamics. And that was the case with the Bitcoin product that we 
a long product backed by Bitcoin that began back in 2016. So here's a, an example where you take basically half of the value of an asset, similar to first mortgages in many ways. You've got this asset and it's asset-based lending. So half of the value comes in the form of a loan. So you have a, a lot of built-in cushion for the volatility. You can see a house go down in value. You can see Bitcoin go down in value. But as long as you have a sufficient cushion to protect the principal, then that volatility is less of a factor and you can focus more on the return profile, the interest income that you have from being able to lend. So we talked about it being a credit fund and income fund. How does a reverse mortgage product or investment provide you guys income if they're not making any payments? If that's just accruing over time, how are you gaining income for that type of investment? So that's where the benefit of a fund versus an individual loan and investment comes into play. So we actually have a portfolio where we have exposure to hundreds of thousands of loans and homes across the United States that are backing these reverse mortgages. And as a result, you get a really diverse population of cash flows. And that has created this income stream that we see on a monthly basis because there's different seasoning and different ages of the borrowers. So with a reverse mortgage product, the older a borrower is, the more of their home value they're able to access. So a 95-year-old is able to access more of their, their home value, but their maturity event, typically their you know, the unfortunate death or the choice to sell the house to move into a retirement home occurs earlier than, say, somebody who's 65. And so you get this portfolio construction of a diversified loan mix. So you're one of the guys behind the A3 Alternative Credit Fund, which launched back in October of last year, and it's traded on the NASDAQ under ticker AAACX. The fund has shown strong performance through the economic and public health crisis that we've been experiencing, which is rare for income funds. What do you attribute this to? I would say it's, it's the unusual or unique value drivers that we're focusing on, and, and those being things that are away from what is driving market narrative broadly in other asset classes. It, it's hard to find an investment thesis that doesn't involve the words Fed policy XYZ in today's market. And we try to avoid that because hopefully what the Fed does with rates doesn't affect you know, a senior citizen's life, doesn't put their life in jeopardy. And the cash flows from reverse mortgages, as an example, are really based off of the long longevity of the borrower. You know? And so if they die, that's unfortunate and that's a, that's a cash flow event. We actually benefit from the longevity. I like being on the reverse mortgage side these days versus the life settlements where I started my career because in the life settlements space, that was more life insurance policies where you're profiting off death, which I prefer profiting off the longevity in which we, we see in, in this product, but it's unique. And so it's finding drivers like insurance, like taxation power, like demographics that can be a investment thesis rather than a P multiple of a stock or business model. It's a niche market. The fund has also had relatively little volatility during the last six months of turbulence that we've seen, with your credit fund only dropping about 6% or so from late February to late March, mid-March, late March, when we saw the S&P down about 30% or so. What about the credit fund causes it to be more stable than other financial instruments? Do you expect this to continue into the future with this type of fund? The fund was quite a bit in the early part of the year, over 10%, and that cushioned some of the pullback that we saw in March and kept us positive. Year to date, we're up double digits and are currently outperforming the S&P 500 with a fraction of the volatility. And I think that has to do with the income and the value being driven from the coupon or yield of the portfolio rather than the appreciation or depreciation of the assets themselves. So it's a different type of investing. You're investing really in the cash flow rather than a speculative position on the value of the asset itself. Central banks, they appear to really have been quite successful in calming the market volatility that has been driving sort of this financial asset recovery. But it's, it's just in such far contrast to what we're feeling in the real economy. 
And that continues to be in, in contrast to unemployment figures. It continues to be in contrast to delinquency data for loans. And I worry about the confidence level. It feels like markets are at this point of, of high confidence and moments of overconfidence rarely and gracefully. And so that's where I find there to be comfort in a portfolio that is highly rated. In our case, we have over 90% of our investments that are AAA rated. So we move up in credit quality and that helps to reduce a lot of the volatility through out cycles that doesn't in fully insulate it. But the, the fact that the, the return is really that cash flow base and that we try to target a double digit cash, a yielding cash flow, and that helps to stabilize the portfolio over time. It's often said that more risk equals more reward. And while I don't necessarily agree with the idea that volatility is risk, it's often used as a measure of risk. Does the lower volatility that your fund has had recently indicate that there may be lower reward or lower upside in the future? It's difficult to project the future, of course, but I can tell you that few investors have exposure to these types of, of niche investments, and I really think they should. There's very little correlation to traditional indices. And that as a diversifier to a portfolio has great benefit. I, I worry about the comfort in sort of false diversification where a lot of investors buy bonds. And when I say bonds, generally, you're talking about the big asset classes, the treasuries and mortgages and, and corporates. And of course, they all act differently in different environments, but they're in many ways, a hedge or viewed as a hedge to equities to try to balance the portfolio. And what we have seen, and we certainly saw in March, is that there can be periods of high correlation just when you need that hedge to occur. And all of a sudden, everything is moving down in tandem. When you position a portfolio that has value drivers that are, that are unique, then oftentimes you'll find that the volatility and the cash flows are also unique. And that causes low correlation. That also helps stabilize. And we're not buying deeply discounted investments and hoping that they return to par. We're buying investments that are performing, that are government guaranteed, and that we hope will meet our, our target yields. It's an analysis around prepayment, analysis around mortality and life expectancy, which are risks that in many ways are more actuarial in nature. And so that provides a cushion and we try to target the yield and the coupon. So if we're able to drive our return based off of the coupon, then there might be further upside as you're reselling those assets or trading those assets into the future. It's a different framework, I think, than a position where an equity type of investment that doesn't have the cap upside that a credit investment has. I'm no actuary by any means, but when I hear that your portfolio is so driven off of mortality rates and life expectancy and things of that nature, I'm a bit surprised that the current crisis that we're experiencing hasn't added more volatility to your product. Specifically, you know, maybe if the housing market crashed, that wouldn't impact you guys as much because that's not necessarily impacting life expectancy. But when we have a public health crisis like we're experiencing right now, that is directly impacting people's life expectancy. I mean, that's probably bringing down people's life expectancy, especially it's impacting the older demographic more. So I'm curious to see why you think that might not have impacted your fund if that's potentially impacting your actuarial tables and things of that nature. You're right. You think about who is most at risk with COVID-19, it's seniors. And I think what's unique here is that the reverse mortgage product is designed for those that want to stay in their homes and live in their homes rather than move to retirement uh, communities. Right? And as a result, that is social distancing to begin with. Now, there has been an uptick in mortality as a result of, of COVID, but it's, there's more stability and historical reference points that we can rely on and use as a, as a, a valuation metric. And that's where these probability-weighted scenarios come into play. What is the probability of, of a certain spike in, in certain age groups or locations and things of that nature? And it's a highly un uncorrelated factor. So it's, it's a unique 
experience that and stress that this portfolio and this particular product has undergone this year. Triple A CX sounds like a pretty unique fund. And I know it's not an asset that I've heard a lot of people invest in. And you mentioned it that not a lot of people invest in it either. So where does it fit in an investor's portfolio? Who is this type of investment or fund best for? Institutional investors have a lot of access and a variety of different solutions to solving this income problem that, that we're addressing. And mostly those come in the form of hedge funds or PE funds that have restrictions related to high net worth and capital lockups and generally are opaque type structures. So we've tried to create a product that is more accessible, that is able to be invested without accreditation and has a ticker. It's through a closed-end fund structure called an interval fund. And this is a, a type of product that is becoming more and more popular. It provides a means to access our sort of mix of public and private investments in a daily valued transparent vehicle with current pricing, but it It also has a quarterly liquidity. So currently we make available 10% of the fund's assets to a tender offer to our investors. So there's somewhat of a locked up capital and that allows us really to invest in these types of products that are longer generally in in nature. So it's, it's not your money market fund alternative, but it is a really unique and what I believe a valued asset within a broader portfolio of an individual's makeup. So since AAA CX is traded on the NASDAQ, can someone just log into their brokerage account and invest in the fund? And if not, how can an investor invest in a fund like this? As an entrepreneur building these new products, we put a lot of thought into what was the right format to sort of take this strategy and bring it to the market. And what I found was there's lots of walls that are up in our financial system. And so depending on who you use as your broker and whether you use an investment advisor, you may be able to invest in it directly. And that will hopefully increase over time as we get on more and more platforms. But today there are some limitations. So if you're interested in buying and are having any problems, please reach out to us. Our phone number is 303-997-9010. You can email us at ir at a3.financial or we're in Denver, Colorado. So if you want to come by and and have a conversation with us, we'd be happy to to talk more about any credit products. And I'll be sure to put links to phone number, email, website, everything in the show notes. So if anybody listening wants to contact based on that info, you can find that below in the show notes. As we wrap up the show, Warren Buffett is famous for recommending investors focusing on and really only investing in things that that are within their circle of competency. This seems like it could be outside a lot of people's circle of competency. I'd probably have to study it a little bit more before I was comfortable to invest in it and before it was within my circle of competency. So how can an investor become comfortable with investing in a security or fund like this? Yeah, I think it's true. And it's interesting because for us, the AAA CX is specifically designed to be non-traditional. That's what I've always done in my career and found success in. So being contrarian. And that's where a lot of the value drop in is within the portfolio and within the securities. It's not your grandparents' bond fund, but it is a income fund that is designed to profit from your grandparents' longevity and demographic trends and you know taxation. There are Plenty of research materials that we make publicly available on our website that walks you through our process and how we look at each of our investments. Because it's it's, it's about having an investment thesis, testing it, seeing how it performs over time, stressing that thesis and saying, under these various scenarios, how does this perform? Does this protect your investment? Does it provide the income stream that we anticipate? And if not, then reassessing that over time and reassessing the probabilities. And in today's environment where there's so much uncertainty, so much stress on cash flows from consumers to businesses, I think the downside probabilities in in credit and loans and and, and debt products generally have become, unfortunately, all that more 
likely. So it's important to be comfortable with the, the credit protections that are there. And that's where we like to have that asset that can be sold, where we like to see you know, some structure or some sort of guarantees, whether it's individual or from the federal government that provide greater assurances that we're going to receive our money back when we expect it. I think reading those research reports and understanding the thesis behind these investments would be super helpful for people listening that are trying to understand this better. I know I'm going to go read them and see if I could add this type of investment or alternative asset to my circle of competency so I could look into potentially investing in it. So where might somebody listening today be able to go and find those research reports? Our website is a great source, a3.financial. That's the website. And you can reach out to us and we'll happy to direct you in other ways. I encourage all of your listeners to look for the stones that haven't been turned over because the investment universe is really, really very broad. And there's so much more than just stocks and and mortgages and treasuries out there that can provide a lot of value and a lot of diversification and, and frankly, a lot of fun to learn about and explore because you'll be amazed at the creativity of investors and how people seek to make money from a, a cash flow. Yeah, I know a lot of the audience here likes to dive into these types of things and likes to spend the time researching it. So I'm sure they'll get a lot of value and and just probably honestly have a lot of fun from reading these reports and you know learning something new about an investment product that they never heard of. And it's interesting because you talked about how big the bond market is and that even doesn't really get that much coverage on, you know, financial media or news outlets. You don't see it that often on CNBC. It's pretty much all equities. That's the exciting sexy part of investing. So, it is really interesting to have this conversation about an alternative asset and even have the opportunity to go learn about it. And I'm thankful that there's these publicly available resources that we can go learn and and understand the thesis behind. So Greg, thank you so much for providing those resources and for coming on the show and providing a bunch of great information. Absolutely. It was a lot of fun. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Millennial Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.